God will give you the respect, give you the joy, give you the authority in your life to live, give you freedom, and give you liberty. It's all about relationship. The closer you get to someone, the closer you get to someone, the more the relationship is built. The more that it's built, the more that it's favored can walk in God's glory and sense his power. Thursday morning as I come to the church and I was doing devotions and singing and praising and, 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 and then the thought to Mason come to my heart and I, I I just danced all over the front of this. Wasn't nobody here but me and Jesus. I just says thank you Jesus for such joy. Made my cup run over to see the joy I danced shouted whatever you want to call it twirled thank you Lord Jesus Christ the joy of the Lord how your relationship with the Lord is your strength it's your strength you can be seated thank you Natasha thank you everyone thank you for engaging in worship. Jeff. Amen. Richard who? It is good that you can have spiritual brothers and sisters that will break your heart. You love them immensely. Forsake not the assembling, the gathering of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more as you see the day approaching, Jesus is coming back. 
and I don't know when he's coming, but I do believe I will be alive. But I do believe this, and I believe it on the authority of Scripture, that James says the farmer waits. He has patience, the early rain, the latter rain. On the day of Pentecost, without a doubt, that was the early rain. But also there is a latter rain at the end, at the maturing of the crop, and the farmer in the field, the wheat, and whatever they planted in Israel, but also there is the maturing of the crop right before Jesus comes. There's going to be a, an outpouring of God's Spirit. But His Spirit will be poured out upon your life if you're hungry and thirsty. I opened Wednesday night with a verse. And I, was, I left here and I went home and I told my wife, I said, I may have been harsh. But Isaiah 44, verse number 3 says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. Speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then I said, are we showing ourselves thirsty? And I did more pointing than I did pointing back at me. Well, for the rest of the week, Thursday night, I had recorded a movie, and I sat down to start to watch the movie. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, are you showing yourself thirsty? So I just got up, and after he spoke the second or third time, I turned the TV off, and I went back to my study room. He did the same thing Thursday morning about 1.30. He said, are you showing yourself thirsty? And I'm thinking, and I know when you wake up then, you can't go back to sleep. And so he did it again Friday morning. He says, are you showing yourself thirsty? At, a little bit earlier, at 1 o'clock, and I went back to bed probably somewhere around 2.30 or close to 3 because I wanted to get at least an hour before I was time to get up. But are you showing yourself thirsty, Dan? And so for the rest of the week, the Holy Spirit's been pointing back at me and saying, are you showing yourself thirsty? Are you going after Jesus with a fresh passion in your life? Because if you are, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Pastor Jeffrey, in the outline, we're going to start with slide number eight. We're not going to do the first ones in there. I spoke last week, and we spoke from Acts chapter number 19, that Paul went to Ephesus, and he found some disciples there, and they were missing something in their life. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because Paul is a very seasoned apostle, and he knows that you can get saved, but not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they said, we have not so much as heard. So we taught them about Jesus more perfectly. And they didn't have a good understanding of Jesus. They just had an understanding of John the Baptist. So he told them about Jesus and he prayed for them. And so then he goes into the synagogue and he preaches for three months. And finally they push him out the door. And last week we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. Working within our life, changing us on the inside, but then working in our life to come out. And so we talked a little bit about Paul's tenacious perseverance, about whatever he come against him, God give him the fire in his soul. And we talked about some liberating, but there's a story within the story here. And so what's the story within the story? Paul, God is doing, the Bible says, and God did extraordinary miracles by Paul or through Paul. Not that Paul did extraordinary miracles, but God was doing them through him. Sometimes we think that we're doing them. We get confused. But it says God was doing them through Paul. He was absolutely using him. And the Holy Spirit wants to use everyone in this room. He wants to use me. And he is putting the vice on me. Are you showing yourself thirsty, Dan? It's got to be more than just preparing for the message. It's got to be more than just here on Sunday morning, Sunday night. But it's, it's a continual thirsting in God's law. And your mind meditates on him. And you're wanting to build a relationship with him. You're wanting to be pleasing to him. And so as these uh, miracles were taking place, he would pray for people. And it's obvious it's obvious that he laid his hands on a few people, and he says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, demon spirits come out, or these seven sons of Sceva would not have tried the scheme. They went and found them somebody, and they say, we adjure you, we command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of them. And the devil looked back at them, and he says, I know Paul, and I know Jesus, but I don't know you. 
I can assure you this. The devil knows every believer in this room. He knows the day that your heart bows. Your he knee may not bow because you may have arthritis, okay? But he knows the day that your heart bows and says, come in, Jesus, come in, Jesus, come in. And he goes after you. We are in a spiritual warfare that's in this life. And so he, it says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know you. And so they must have invited a crowd to watch this because the man beat up seven people. And, and then it, the word spread everywhere, don't play with your religion. Great fear, great reverence come upon everybody. So the story within the story here is building our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in the last verse of that, um, verse 19 and 20, um, it, and while many of those who practice magic brought their books and burned them in front of the crowd, so they calculated the cost of them, and it come to 50,000 pieces of silver and it was in this way that the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. That's what I want to happen in Ivan Assembly of God through Wakulla County. I want it to happen in Kentucky. I want it to happen in Georgia. And God wants it to happen too. God is pulling some chains. We see that in colleges all around America. Different colleges, God is pulling some chains and calling people to pray and intercede. And not only in America, but around the world. And so we find that God is stirring the pot. And so God does extraordinary miracles. And God is building the church in a powerful way. So let's go now to slide number 11. This is what Jesus says. Wow, so that means we've already skipped 10 slides. That don't mean you're going to get out any earlier, okay? But it may. We just don't know. We don't know. I hope that God's in charge, and I hope that he's not near about finished with what he wants to do in my life and in your life. Jesus says this in John chapter 15, and we're not going to go any further than verse 8, but we're going to go back and start back at the beginning in just a moment. But it says this. What a powerful promise this is. If you abide in me. Another translation said, if you remain in me. If this relationship between me and you grows. That's what Jesus Christ is wanting to do. He's wanting the relationship that you have with him to become so intimate, so powerful, so that he can download secrets into you, but also trust you so that he works through you like he did Paul doing extraordinary miracles. You won't never stand there and do this and, and, and say, I've done something great. Paul's attitude throughout his life was like this. Even at the height of his, of his ministry, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He knew that his strength and his power come from Jesus Christ. It's from that relationship that was there. And that's what we want to work on this morning. That is what Jesus is really working within my heart this week. Dan, are you hungering and thirsting? Can't, what are you doing? What do I see in your life that says you're pursuing me in your off hours? <laughs> Not just on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but in your off hours. And so you, we find this powerful promise. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You can ask whatever you wish. There's something about being close to Jesus and having our mind renewed that I won't ask for the Mercedes. I wouldn't want one no way. But there are some things on the bucket list maybe that I would ask for. But the stronger my relationship with God is, I'm not going to ask for things that I really shouldn't have. This will help us in our prayer life. If the relationship is right with God, we'll have more misses with our prayer life because we're not going to ask for the things that God says you don't need that anyway. 
And then sometimes we'll figure out the timing with God that says this is when you need to ask for it. God's got timing that he works with within our life. And sometimes we don't know the exact timing, but the whole time until the time comes, we are pressing, pressing, and pressing, trying to get as close as we can to God. Jesus says God will give you whatever you ask for. But this is when we're, the asking becomes wiser because the relationship is better. And he says, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So we're looking at this thing, this call about God wanting to develop within us. Jesus knew that very shortly he was phys physically going to leave this earth. And he says, you believe in God? Wonderful. You need to believe in me also. And he wanted them also to have a very clear understanding of the potential of their faith if their relationship with him was right. Potential. Everybody say potential. Nobody has ever reached their potential with what Christ wants to do in your life and through your life. God wants to grow us. In his likeness. So he gives us a picture story. It was very plain to the people in Israel what a vine was and what a vine did. That was a large part of their agriculture, just like wheat was. And so they, they were expert with gardening, especially with vineyards. And so he paints a picture so that even years later, and we can today, we can find out from this picture what Jesus Christ wants to do with us. He wants to grow our faith. Let's go to verses 1 and 2. Then we'll go to verses 3 and 4, all right? Jesus says, I am the true vine. There are some fake vines out there, but Jesus says, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away, but every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Just going to focus right now on Jesus is the one I need to get plugged into. He is the light of this world. He's the door to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus stood on John chapter 14, verse number 6, and he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is my source. He is the vine. And all the way down through this, it's like I need to plug into him. I need to stay with him. And he tells us how to nurture that relationship. He is the way. There's no other name under heaven that we can be saved except by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ. There's no other name that I can go to God the Father and ask something. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I don't have no merit on my own. I'm asking Jesus in my name. To, I'm asking Jesus because I've paid tithes for years. Jesus said, no, no, no. You got to come. God is saying you got to come by Jesus. By Jesus. There's no other name under heaven. He is the way. And Jesus Christ is the absolute truth that we need to hang on every word that he says. It's amazing what God can do in people's hearts if we will unite with him in his spirit. The boy Bart that wrote that song, I Can Only Imagine. Can you imagine what he was like in his room that day whenever he was putting that song together and the Holy Spirit coming there? He began to say, I can only imagine. Something was going on there that he penned a song that's been around and sold millions and millions and millions. But God wants us to have a relationship with him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I cannot get to heaven except through Jesus. There's no eternal life. There's not a doctor that can make me have living forever and ever. He is the eternal life. And God the Father is the vine dresser. I know in the last few verses of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says this. All power in heaven and in earth has been committed unto me. That is the absolute truth. But this is a truth here also that Jesus spoke. He's the vine. God the Father is the vine dresser. The word vine dresser means that he's the, the husbandman. He's the pruner. He's the owner of everything. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. God is as earnest and me bearing fruit and you bearing fruit as Jesus is bearing fruit because the more fruit that I bear and you bear, the more that God's kingdom is going to grow and be glorified. 
We want his kingdom to grow. My father is the vine dresser. God don't have any branches that don't bear no fruit. That's what the Bible says. Every branch in me that don't bear fruit, he takes it away. Don't listen to some slick commentary that tells you that, yeah, you, you, God's just waiting for you to bear fruit. The day that we get saved, we begin to start to bear fruit. It is how we, we are changed, 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 changed. The day I got saved, I was changed. I've changed a lot since then. <laughs> it's an ongoing absolute process that begins to take place within our life. And it says this, what happens in this process of change? Change has been taking place this week. I didn't feel too happy when I had recorded that movie off a of pixel. And I'm sitting, oh, I get to watch this now. And I sat down there and God says, are you showing yourself thirsty? And I'm thinking, Ugh. and I sat there and I, and I didn't listen to him. He's, it was either the second time or the third time. I'm thinking, God, you mean business. And I've done told my congregation on Wednesday night, are you showing yourself thirsty? And God's wanted me to show myself thirsty for him. And so we find that Jesus is, or God the Father is the vine dresser. The vine dresser prunes the vine. Now, the, uh, uh, a vine, a grapevine gets pruned every year. Every year. In the spring of the year, it gets pruned. If that was a physical person and we are taking the pruning, it can be painful. Some of the changes that takes place in our life, we don't like God to do it. That's a fact. If you want to grow with Christ, whenever he puts his finger on something, you need to get rid of it because you're not going to grow anywhere else in your life until he deals with that first. Jesus is wanting to deal with us on a personal basis. He's wanting to work within us to build righteousness and holiness and some fruitfulness in our life. In the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament, in Jeremiah's day, Judah and Benjamin, the southern tribes, Jerusalem, they were fixing to be carried off into captivity, and Jeremiah is prophesying this. God's telling him, I want them to change. And then he tells them that they're going into captivity for 70 years because they just refuse the change. And sometimes it takes discipline to change us. We don't like, do Christians get disciplined? Yes, they absolutely do. Don't get disciplined as much as what we need to sometimes, but we do get disciplined. And so we find here that as God is speaking to Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah, I have a message for you, but I can't speak it to you here. You're not going to get the full impact of this. I want you to go to the potter. They had a lot of pottery people in Jeremiah's day. I don't know if this was the biggest pottery around, but Jeremiah went down there and he says, I want to speak to you when you get there. And so he goes down to the potter's house and he's got this wheel and he's pushing the pedal and the wheel's going around and around. He's got some clay on there and he's pouring water on it and he's shaping it and he's shaping it and he's shaping it. Now, a pottery doesn't work real well if you've got little air bubbles in it and he shapes it and he molds it and he tries to get all the air bubbles out of it. Some of you ladies, if you have done some baking with some flour, you, you knead the dough and you mash it and you squeeze it and you gnash it and you squeeze it. Well, the potter was doing the same thing with this clay. Sometimes we can sense in our life God is putting some pressure on parts of our life and it's very uncomfortable. Something we don't want to make a move with just yet. We're going to do it on our timing. Well, God's got his timing he wants to work with. I didn't have to get up. I didn't have to stop watching that movie. I could have just sat right there and I could have missed a blessing. I could have put a stopper. There's a spiritual stopper that sometimes we can put in heaven that we want a blessing and we can't get the blessing until we get the offense out of it. So we find him watching the potter, and it goes around and around. I don't know how close he was to the end to having it finished, what maybe Jeremiah thought, not the trained eye maybe, but uh, the potter was the trained eye, and Jeremiah thought, oh, that's going to look pretty good. And then all of a sudden, the potter goes, ah, mm, 
and he smashes it down and puts some more water on it, and then he begins to do this again to it, and he squeezes it again. And then it goes around and around, but, God, but he made it into a different pot, totally, completely different than what it was before. And God looked at Jeremiah, and he says, this is what I'm trying to do with the house of Israel. I've got to break you, and I've got to squeeze you, and I've got to put some pressure on you to get out of Israel what I'm trying to get out of them. I want my heart and my life to yield to God so that I don't get hurt in the process. Jeremiah, I mean, Jacob walked the rest of his life with his hip out of socket because he was hard to deal with. He just wasn't going to listen to God. And he spent an all-night prayer meeting one day and finally got desperate with God. And he left there with something that lasted him the rest of his life. But he could hear God better after that all-night wrestling match with the angel. So we find here painful growth. God the Father is the vine dresser. Verses 3 and 4. Spiritual cleansing is an absolute process. We don't ever get through with it in this life. We just keep going and going and more perfection, more perfection, more perfection, but never perfect. Okay? More perfection, more perfection, more perfection, but never perfect. Pretty soon, um, I this is an iPhone somewhere down the road, somewhere about 10, 11, 12, 13. Anyway, what? It's a 13. This don't take near the pictures that an iPhone 6 can. They got some now that takes better pictures than this. They just keep perfecting, keep perfecting, and keep perfecting. Jesus Christ in my life is perfecting and perfecting and perfecting and perfecting, doing more and more, but I won't never get perfect. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken unto you. Three and a half years he had walked with his disciples. They had received some strong rebukes. I say strong, strong rebukes. Jesus looked straight into Peter's eyes one day, and he says, get behind me, Satan. How many of us, was we, if we were one of his disciples, and he turned around and looked at us and says, get behind me, Satan. You're like, we're finished. <laughs> we're finished. But later on, Peter would write this in 1 Peter he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Something gripped Peter's heart right then that had pushed down that prideful spirit. The same thing that just prior to that, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked back at him and says, you didn't get that revelation because somebody else told you. He says, the spirit of my father give you that revelation. So he got a revelation that Jesus was the Son of God. And the same spirit that gave him that revelation, when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, that same spirit that gave him that revelation says, bite your tongue, Peter. You need to listen to your teacher there. You need to walk with him. God's got big plans for you. Jesus knew when he called the twelve, whenever Andrew come from John the Baptist at the River Jordan, and Andrew followed him, and then Andrew goes and finds Peter, and he says, I found the Christ. I found the Christ. And Peter comes walking up to Jesus, and he says, Ah, your name is no longer Simon, but it's called Peter, a little rock. Jesus knew right at that moment where he wanted to grow Peter into speaking on the day of Pentecost. Jesus knows right where he wants to grow you and I, but this relationship he has within us. Jesus knew where he wanted to grow Paul the Apostle or Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. He knew that he wanted to get him all the way through three missionary journeys and get him all the way to Nero. He developed him, worked in his life. The stoning was part of that development. The whips and the stripes on his back was part of that development. The fighting and all the anger that people mobbed at him was part of that development. And the fruit of the Spirit began to develop more and more in his life. And so as the fruit of the Spirit developed more and more in his life, also the power of the Spirit, he had a tenacious spirit. You just couldn't discourage him where he says, I'm going to give it up.
God wants to do the same thing to everybody in this room. If mine and your relationship is tight with Jesus, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. If you let him shape and mold you and prune you, me and you're going to get something really good going in your life. You're going to be a light in this community. If you just let me work in your life, Jesus is saying. And I want to make you so fruitful. The Holy Spirit come on Paul. And he spoke about what we have the official gift, the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. But he also speaks in all of his letters about the fruit of the Spirit. And we'll read some of those in just a moment. You are already clean. So there was a process already taking place within his life. It is a process that Christ works. Jesus, Paul never went to Colossae. But while he's in Ephesus, one of his disciples goes to Colossae. And he plants a church. And word gets to Paul when he's in Rome in the prison cell or in his own rented house for two years. And he hears what's going on in Colossae. So he writes them a, a letter. I'm going to relate to you some of that letter, chapter number 3. He says, since you are born again, since you've opened up your life and let Jesus Christ into your life, you no longer live for yourself. Seek those things which are above. If you, and this, this isn't part of this. This comes from Corinthians. Therefore, if any man, woman, boy, or girl be born again, you're a brand new creation. Everything starts all over anew. Whenever I got saved, before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit began to do some work in my life. Got saved Monday night, probably about 10.30 coming home from work. Wednesday night, I hadn't been to church on Wednesday night in 10 years. From the time I got 16, I quit school. I had been to church about five times on Sunday. But something changed in my life. The love of God, the transforming part of the Holy Spirit began to work in my life. And there was a relationship that was developed. The Holy Spirit had adopted me in to being a son of God. And the Holy Spirit was in my heart crying out, Abba, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And it becomes more and more powerful as we go by in this life relationship. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Not only do we take off some of this stuff, we get put to death some of these things lurking. This uh, the, it won't be up on the screen, but the New Living Translation said there's some things lurking in you. <laughs> Have you ever had some of that old stuff prop up in your life that surprised you? Put to death that earthly stuff that's lurking within you. Get rid of also the sexual immorality, the impurity, the lust, the evil desires. Don't be greedy anymore. So we get rid of all of that. But then there's more than getting rid of stuff. We're going to read some verses out of 12 and 13 and 14. But, it, but then this sort of sounds like the fruit of the Spirit. Put on then as God's chosen instrument, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against anybody, forgive them. Man, isn't that something different? We don't go talk about them. We forgive them. Even as Christ has forgiven us, so must we also forgive others. And above all of these things... Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And then we need to nurture this relationship. Sometimes we nurture relationships on Valentine's Day and weddings. I mean, uh, uh, anniversaries and Christmas. Other than that, we might not do too much nurturing. But we need to nurture our relationship with our spouse. We need to nurture our relationship with our children. And we need to nurture our relationship with Jesus Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me. Another translation says, whoever remains in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I need to find out what Jesus likes. I need to spend time with him. I just need to sometimes just look into his eyes and say, I love you. Thank you so much for what you 
don't bring a list of what I want. Bring a list of what I want to say I'm thankful for. Oh, God, I'm so thankful. Nurture that relationship. Hadn't done it. You know, thoughts don't matter a lot unless you do them sometimes. Uh, and and, and I, I will clarify that statement. Uh, I went to the, I got some flowers for my wife on Valentine's Day. This past week, I'm thinking, uh, you need to get her some more flowers. I hadn't done that. Uh, that's why That's why I said, you know, just thinking all to get the flowers ain't, they ain't done me no good. <laughs> hadn't done me no good. She didn't get, she didn't feel none of that. And it may be next week that the Holy Spirit will say, you need to feel it now. <laughs> you need to get with it. But nurturing relationships. Nurture. Get up from the dinner table. Clean it up. She's, she does it all the time. She says, oh, just go over there and sit down. I got the dishes. I'm like, I've done that quite a few times, but I'm getting better to where I'm just thinking, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll sit here. If you're going to do the dishes, I'll dry everything so that whenever you get finished, that, that drain pot over there ain't stacked up this high. Also, you can carry on a relationship talking and sharing while you're drying dishes or doing dishes. Nurture relationships. When you're driving down the road, some people can't stand, can't stand just to get in the car. The, as soon as they get in the car, they got to call somebody because they just can't stand dead time. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Tell him you love him. In his word, do you meditate day and night? Nurture the relationship. Fruitful, when we nurture that relationship, we can bear much fruit. Mark chapter number 4, verse number 20. Jesus gave a parable about the seed that was sown, and this is just one of those. But the one that was sown on the good ground are those who hear the word, and they welcome the word. And it produces a crop, 30. I use the Holman Christian standard because it put the numbers there, 30, 60, and 100. Even if you can't read 30 and written in longhand, you can read 30. I know you can read it just looks better to see the number 30, 60, and 100. Something about the relationship grows. We can begin to expect more fruitfulness in our life to take off because we receive the word and we accept the word and we understand the word. And we need to have a continual abiding, abiding taking place within our life. John 15, verse number 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and they are thrown into the fire and burned. Not going to spend much time there. You get the picture. You just want to stay plugged into Jesus. Natasha, would you come? This message come about. Because the Holy Spirit said the story within the story is about Paul's relationship with Jesus and about seven sons of a priest that had no relationship with Jesus trying to get their prayers answered and just trying to use Jesus. Paul was so powerful in his life because he had a relationship with Jesus. I am crucified with Christ. In the prison cell, he wrote words like this. In Philippians, you can find these. I have not found perfection, but I press on. I keep pushing forward that I may attain that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. He knew that Christ had some more work in his life to do. Before he made that statement, he said this. To depart, to go ahead and die right now and to be with Christ is far better than getting out of here and, and being about ministry. But when I get out, I know that I will have fruitful ministry. He had seen enough in the third heavens that he knew that in front of him, for every believer, there was more than you could ever imagine that God could do. 
He says, but I haven't reached yet where God placed his hand upon my life. I want every one of us in this room to sense a void in our life that's in front of us that God wants to fill. You haven't reached the end of your road yet. You haven't re- I want you to sense that there's somewhere else God wants to take you. You haven't got there. You know the intense love he has for you. You have felt the pressure in your life like the clay, the lump of clay on the wheel and God's putting pressure there. You, you sense it. And it's not for nothing. But God says, I've got more for you. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a full-time preacher, evangelist, or missionary. But it does mean you will be a full-time torch bearer for Jesus. A full-time torch bearer for Jesus. If you're working, Jesus needs somebody where you are working at to let the light shine. When you're at the restaurant or at the store, wherever you're at, and somebody is having a bad day, Jesus needs a torch bearer to speak light and hope to people in this world, to the lost and to believers. There are some believers out there that's like me at times and needs a big word of encouragement. I got a word of encouragement last Sunday when Mason stood up, and then as I thought about it Wednesday morning, I'm thinking, yeah got another word of encouragement this morning that somebody shared with me about it. something that took place two Sundays ago when Christy was leading worship and they says, uh, she said, everybody that needs prayer, stand up. And, and so as they stood and people were prayed for, they, they, I heard a word this morning, God really did something in my life that morning in that little moment. And not, not, not later at the end of the message, but at that moment, God did something extraordinary. And then later in the afternoon or that morning when Pastor Jeffrey gave the altar call, God did some more things in their life. Paul said, I have not attained yet. There's something out in front of all of us that God wants to accomplish in us and through us. The power of relationship. The result of abiding in him. Paul said, I have not attained yet. Verses 7 of 8 of John 15, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove yourselves to be my disciples. Fruit bearing, it is absolutely, it is absolutely having the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control, the faithfulness in our lives. But also the fruit bearing also is reaching souls because you have a kind spirit and you reach out to people. You see people like Zacchaeus that's hungry, but they're not going to take the first step. Zacchaeus never would have had a meal with Jesus if Jesus hadn't initiated the first step. The woman in Samaria never would, maybe never would have received Christ if Christ hadn't taken the first step. And so God's calling some of us in this room to take a first step moment. And this happens because we are walking in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit's in us. And so we are sharing the love and the joy. But then the first step happens because they have seen a witness in our life that is the joy, the love, the peace, and the gentleness that's reaching out to people that still, like the woman in the well, she pushed back against Jesus and Jesus just kept reaching in. Have you ever been rebuffed and you felt like that Jesus says you just need to keep reaching in? And he kept reaching in. Such a powerful life. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my disciples. It is the fruit of the Spirit being developed in our life. It's also people being one, 
by the character and by the spirit that draws them. But also, Jesus says there is a way that we can have such a relationship with him that more and more prayers are answered. We can ask bigger prayers than we would ever dream to ask before, but because they are in direct line with the will of God, we can get it because our faith begins to grow. Every head bowed just for a moment. Father, I'm asking, I'm asking, Father, 